All right. Hello, everyone. This is Katrina Van Hus. I'm the CEO at Turnkey. Uh, I'm here today with Otis Fulton and Randy Corey. A um, couple of notes. Uh, I have two big dates coming up in, um, well, one day I will celebrate my third anniversary of marriage with Otis Fulton. So we are married. We have to tell people that right up front because it's weird if we don't, because we act like we're married. And if you don't know it, that's strange. And number two, uh, on October 1st, I will celebrate my 29th anniversary of serving the peer-to-peer -peer industry. So if you were ever at a national meeting <clears throat> and got too to toasty in the bar, I probably know about it. We know where all the bodies are. <laughs> so um, today I'm, I'm fortunate to be here both with my husband and um, with Randy. And my role really is to get the best stuff out of them for you. So I will drop in and out of the conversation to pull out tidbits that I know Randy knows and I know Otis knows um, to give you the best that we have to offer today. Um, one of the things that I think is very interesting is Randy has done peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for a really long time. And what we find is when we talk with Randy, she does things naturally that we are putting a name to. And we are helping you understand the recipe for success. And that is um, making it more of a science <clears throat> than an art. Next. And my beloved is advancing slides for me. So thank you, Otis. So um, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about Randy um, before I introduce her. And she is um, she's pretty powerful. Uh, these statistics are just a few that we pulled out. Her event series is up 18% year over year for walk. Her average fundraising is 140. Um, she is a Blackboard client, and uh, her online fundraising is 105 versus the benchmark of 83 uh, for Blackboard. Her average team fundraising, 1489, and she's up 31% in participation year over year. So how do you get to those statistics? Um, Randy, I just want you to um, say hello just for a moment. If you could just take a real brief tour through your history and enumerate some of the positions that you've held before coming to hydrocephalus. Sure, happy to. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. So uh, as Katrina said, I have been in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for a very long time. Um, I started my peer-to-peer -peer or my special event fundraising career as the executive director for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in upstate New York. I then uh, joined the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and uh, opened their first office in Albany, New York, and then transferred to Raleigh, North Carolina to open their first office in Eastern North Carolina. I was with JDRF for eight years, and then I spent five years as the state director uh, of North Carolina for the March of Dimes. Um, I joined the Hydrocephalus Association eight years ago, and um, uh, to be very honest, it was a, a big switch in culture. It took me a little while to get my feet under me, but uh, love my job, love what we do, and can't, can't imagine doing anything else. Excellent. Thank you, Randy. Um, I think one of the interesting things that Randy brings to this conversation, and one of the reasons she was the perfect guest, um, is because she has worked inside the bigs, you know, uh, national organizations with field offices, and she now is in uh, Hydrocephalus Association, which is a nonprofit that serves a mission that has few affected in the general population. So it's a very different playing field, and yet the things that she brings to the table work there too. So she is, in general, um, disproved the myth that it's completely different. There are some differences, but um, fundraising is fundraising, humans are human. So with that, um, next, with that, we're gonna move to how do you do what we're trying to do, which is at the end of the day, build affinity. Because if we can build affinity with our constituents, we can get them to do the actions that we need them to do to, me to meet our mission. In specific, we can get them to fundraise, we can get them to donate, we can get them to become volunteer leadership. With that, I'm going to introduce my husband, Otis Fulton, who is our VP of Behavioral Economics at Turnkey and also a PhD candidate um, right now in social psychology. So with that, Otis, talk to us about how humans work. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. Uh, it's, it's so much fun to be here. You know, um, as Katrina mentioned, I am literally a student of human behavior. At the age of 58, I decided to go back and get a PhD in social psychology. 
I got my master's in social psychology way back in the 80s after disco was dead. So it had been a while. And, you know, <laughs> if you remember as an undergraduate taking your first social psychology course, it's, you know, an interesting, enjoyable experience. You learn many fascinating things about human behavior, some of which validate your common sense assumptions and some of which contradict it. But it can be a fun experience. Uh, you know, social psychology has very interesting experiments. But then as you get in as a graduate student, it really can be an intellectually wrenching experience. Um, you know, for most of us, your most basic assumptions about the nature and causes of human behavior are challenged. And at the end of the whole thing, you wind up, you know, really having a different view of human behavior that most people in society do. Uh, and so I, I kind of think it rivals philosophy and its ability to teach people that they really don't truly understand the nature of the world. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of ideas that may seem counterintuitive. You know, the first is what psychologists call mind reading. It's the inescapable inclination to see and understand others in terms of their intentional mental processes. Well, you know, what does that mean? That was, that, that quote was from Fritz Heider way back in 1946, the great social psychologist. What that means is this, we all watch other people consciously and unconsciously to try to figure out their intentions. We want to be able to predict what others are going to do around us, and we devote a great deal of cognitive energy, again, both co consciously and unconsciously, to doing that. Now, you know, that doesn't seem so, so unusual. Yeah, you know, we watch people, and uh, that doesn't seem so, uh, so counterintuitive and so forth. Well, what is counterintuitive is something that we've learned since 1946, just in the last 20 years, and that's this. We watch our own behavior in the same way as we watch others to try to understand what it is we believe. It, it feels different because we have access to our memories, to our emotions and so forth, but it's the same process as we, as we are watching other people trying to figure them out. We watch ourselves and try to figure ourselves out. So, uh, you know, that can seem very counterintuitive, but it's important if you want to motivate people. The other big thing to take away from uh, kind of giving you a crash course in uh, social psychology graduate level here is this. You know, behavior is mostly situational. We all think, gosh, you know, Frank, he's a very altruistic person. He's a very charitable person. He's a very kind person. She's a selfish person, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we attribute a lot of people's behavior to these, what psychologists call dispositions. But psychologists know that uh, it's very difficult to predict how anyone is going to behave in a novel situation from their dispositions. It's almost always situational. So let me give you an example. There was a classic study of seminary students, and they, uh, were encounter they encountered a homeless man in a doorway as they were on their way to class. Now, wouldn't you think that seminary students would be the ones that would stop and help the homeless person Help us, the homeless person uh, asked for help very specifically. Well, sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. In some cases, 10% of the seminary students stopped and helped this guy. In other cases, 63% stopped and helped him. The difference was this, whether or not they were late to class. So, you know, we tend to think of these things as dispositions. Gosh, who should be more uh, caring and charitable than, than seminary students? But really, their behavior, like everyone's else behavior, is really guided by uh, these situations. And so, I'm going to, yeah. So this, before you go forward, um, I, I think that um, I have heard Randy say something so similar to this, but using different words. And uh, Randy, you and I had a conversation about this. Could you share? Sure. Um, and, and, you know, one of the, the great values that uh, Otis has added to uh, our relationship or my relationship with Katrina is a lot of these things I've been doing and didn't know why, and now I'm starting to understand why. But there's a tremendous amount of psychology in fundraising and working with volunteers. And one of the things that uh, I've learned, especially here at the Hydrocephalus Association, where all of our events are volunteer-driven, we don't have chapter offices, we don't have chapter staff, uh, we run 42 walks across the country, run by volunteers. And, you know, in our case, most of our P2P fundraisers are people with a connection to the mission. You know, for health organizations, that probably means somebody with 
a child with hydrocephalus, a child with diabetes, uh, an adult with a heart condition. Um, now, you would think that these would be the low-hanging fruit, that these would be the people that are going to be most passionate about your cause, and they're going to be the ones that get involved. And that's not always true. Because of their situation, they're busy. A lot of times they have children with special needs. They have full-time jobs outside the home. Uh, you know, they have families and other responsibilities. They may be a scout leader. And then on top of this, we're asking them to volunteer and, and lead a walk uh, or some other event for us. Um, I also maintain, uh, because I've seen it, that the further you get from the hospital room, in our case, the further you get from the last brain surgery, um, the less urgent your mission becomes. So, um, you know, if you're working for the Diabetes Found, uh, Foundation and you have a child uh, with diabetes and the child is on an insulin pump and has a continuous glucose monitor, hopefully doing well, what this often means is extended family and friends think he's cured. So they don't really need my help anymore because he's cured. Um, one of the, you know, so often people will do what they're asked when they're asked by the right person. And I think that's, that's a huge point, the right person doing the ask. Uh, you know, they're bombarded by millions of nonprofits. There's 1.5 million 501c3s in the U.S. right now. And uh, while some of my colleagues have said, oh, you know, the, the well of charitable giving money is bottomless, I disagree. Uh, I think everybody only has so many dollars they can give to charity, whether it's a corporation or a person. And, you know, if it's going to charity A, that means there's going to be less for charity B or, or charity C. So there's just a tremendous amount of, uh, psychology and and the prospective volunteers personal situation that goes into this so I think that what Randy's describing is is what Otis is describing um, that homeless gentleman in a stairwell asking for help is is uh, getting responsiveness based on the situation the other person is in. So just because someone says no to you, even though they have a mission connection, it feels like they should say yes, um, potentially don't write them off. It could be simply that they are situationally unable to react to you. So with that, let me pass it back to you, Otis, and tell us how do we, how do we create situations that will elicit the behaviors that we're after. That's exactly what we're after. And uh, I want to give you an example of a study that was done by a friend of mine at Stanford University, social psychologist there. And what they wanted to know was, um, how do people feel after doing someone a favor? And so they brought subjects in and they uh, let them play a game where they won some money, but it was about $10. And after, uh, after they had won the money and the, the experiment was over, the real experiment began. And it was this, uh, some of the subjects, the experimenter approached them and he said, hey, you know what, uh, that was my own money. I'm gonna have to ask you for that back. I'm, I'm short and I have to have it for gas. Uh, some of the other subjects, someone else came in the room, introduced himself as the department chairman said, hey, you know what, I, this, Bob wasn't really supposed to give you that money. I'm gonna have to ask you for it back. It's the department's money. And in the third group, they just got to keep the money that they want. And then they surveyed the people and they asked them who liked the researcher more. Was it the people asked by the researcher for the money back, the people asked by someone else for the money back, the department chair, or the people who got to keep the money? Now, you know, intuitively, people usually say, oh, the people who got to keep the money like the researcher more. But overwhelmingly, it was the people who were asked by the researcher for the money back that liked him more. So, you know, how can we explain this? Well, this is an example of what psychologists uh, have come to call the Ben Franklin effect. They call it that because Ben Franklin wrote about a bitter political enemy that he asked to loan him. Uh, he asked if he would loan him a book. And after Ben Franklin returned the book to him, he noticed that uh, the guy had done a 180. Now he introduced him. He was uh, uh, very friendly to him and just a huge turnabout in his behavior. And it turns out 
that if we, if someone, uh, if we do someone a favor, we are going to feel more positively towards them than if they did a favor for us. And, uh, you know, this is very, this is a kind of a crucial thing for motivating people in our fundraisers. Every time someone does uh, something on behalf of your organization, it's an opportunity for their bond with you, that affinity to be increased. But, you know, we usually don't look at it that way. We're usually reluctant to ask people to do too much, but it's really the opposite. Every time they do something for us, their bond to us, their affinity is increased with one important caveat. We've got to recognize them every time they do something on our behalf. And I'd like to show you some research from, this is from the- uh, hey, Curtis, Nash Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to see if Randy has any experience on this front, because this is really a big deal. We hear this all the time in, um, in our work that, you know, I, we ask too much, or I can't ask that mm -hmm. volunteer to, um, to support us financially because they're giving all our time. Randy, um, you know, what we're talking about is creating situations through asking them for a favor that will elicit the response that we want. In your experience, um, tell, tell us what you think about asking people to do stuff. Okay, sure. Um, actually, I sort of have a perfect example. Um, when I transferred with Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation to Raleigh, North Carolina to open their first office, there was nothing here. There was no board, there was no office, there was no chapter. I had never set foot in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and I was trying to get into some of the big companies in the area. So, you, you know, I did what all of you would do. I subscribed to the Triangle Business Journal. I got out the book of lists. I started making cold calls to go visit as many C-level uh, managers as I could at the big companies. And, you know, it's a lot easier to get that appointment when you're calling on behalf of a charity than if you're selling printers or copiers. Um, but I went to one of them that I really wanted to get my foot in and said, um, you know, we've put together a board of directors, but we don't have a place to hold a board meeting. Could we use one of your meeting rooms or your cafeteria? Now, this is a major company in Research Triangle Park, which is a big industrial park here in North Carolina. And they said, yeah, sure, we can do that, because it was easy to say yes to that ask. So they said, sure, use the boardroom. Well, what this meant was one of their executives sort of had to hang around while we're in the building because the meeting is in the evening. And we invited the executive to sit in on the meeting. And then um, he became more interested in the cause. And then we asked them if um, you know, we could use their cafeteria to stuff our team captain's packets on a weekend and they said yes to that. Well, fast forward four or five months down the road and uh, the CEO of that facility is now on my board of directors. Uh, they're sponsoring the walk. They're putting together big walk teams, but it started with an easy ask, something that was easy for them to say yes to. Um, and, and, and even if you hear no, as I always tell our volunteers, no doesn't mean no forever. No means no for right now. Randy, I think that is a brilliant story. And I think um, Otis is probably making notes about how to incorporate it in our, in our next blogger book, because that is <laughs> that, so many principles that we talk about, you know, you create know a situation, well. start, sm start small. You um, know me too well. Yes. You know, this is that, that's a perfect example. You know, what kind of people do we do favors for? Again, remember that, you know, we're always watching ourselves. We do favors for, for people who we like. So if, if Randy said, make it easy to, to say yes, if we can get someone to do a favor for us, we're watching our own behavior and that person who who gave that boardroom is thinking, gosh, you know, Randy's organization is, is, is a pretty good thing. You know, Randy's a good person or else why would I have let them use the, the, uh, the boardroom? So uh, that, that's just a great point. Should I continue, Katrina? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Five years of interrupting me. It's, I'm, I'm used to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we often, uh, th this is data from the National Awareness Use at Attitudes and Usage Study. They looked at 98,000 donors who had given uh, 
20, uh, up to $2,500 per year for a period of years to organizations, but then stopped. And so they went and they surveyed these 98,000 people and they asked them, why did you stop giving? Now, the last reason that they listed was solicitation overreach. They were asked too often or asked too much. That was the last thing that made them stop. Look down here at the bottom. The, the biggest reason they stopped giving was they weren't acknowledged or thanked for a previous gift or they were never asked to donate again. So, you know, we have this, this feeling that we're asking people too much where actually people are saying, no, you know, we're, we're declining to continue because no one's asking us anymore. So it's act, actually the exact opposite of, uh, you know, our perceptions on why people do and don't uh, give to our organizations in many cases. Randy, what's your experience on that front with staff and, and coaching? Uh, them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, again, it, it, First of all, as a fundraiser, you develop a thick skin. You know, um, you don't take it personally when someone says no because you don't know their situation. So if I go to, you know, the executive vice president of a bank and try and get them involved with my cause and he says, no, we can't do that, it's, you know, I don't take that personally. He's not saying that about me. He's not even saying that about my organization. What he's saying is it doesn't fit in with our corporate, you know, causes, uh, or I have a child with MS, or I have, uh, you know, I'm being transferred to Hong Kong. We don't know what his situation is. So I tell them, don't take it personally. And then um, one of my favorite tricks is if somebody says no, is ask them, who can you refer me to? Who might be interested? And I can't tell you how many times I ended up getting in the door of someplace I never would have gotten into. Now, I will admit, uh, being from the north, I was a little pushy. I used to ask him to make that phone call while I was sitting there. Uh, <laughs> after, after a few months, I learned down here in the south, you just don't do that. But um, uh, it, they got me indoors. And it's it's who they have leverage over. So what I'm doing is leveraging their leverage. And uh, again, you can't take it personally. It isn't personal, but it doesn't make you stop asking. I have walk chairs who have said it took them six years to secure a sponsor they've been asking year after year after year, but finally got it. Very nice. All right, back to you, Otis. Well, you know, let's talk about motivating volunteers. You know, what is it that people find motivating in general? Um, Daniel Pink wrote a great book on this called Drive. Uh, I highly recommend it if you've never uh, read it. Uh, he looks at an area of psychology called self-determination theory. And, you know, when you go out and ask people who are satisfied in various aspects of their life what, uh, what, what they have in common, they, they talk about three things. He calls it the trifecta for satisfaction. They feel a sense of autonomy. You know, no one's micromanaging them. They have an opportunity to develop mastery or competence. It's something they think is important. And, you know, very crucial is they're, they, they feel like they're being part of some, something that's bigger than themselves. You know, when you give people autonomy, it tells, it tells them that, they, they, uh, that you trust them. Well, when they, they feel like uh, they're doing something and they're becoming more competent, you know, recognize them. And then uh, uh, being part of something bigger than themselves, that's kind of the whole idea behind nonprofits. And, and that's why people say that many times that they're involved. Um, you know, we know that volunteerism is so positive for people. Uh, people who, there's a study out of the University of Texas that says that people who are involved in two or more nonprofit organizations actually have a lower risk of mortality than people who are involved in none. So, you know, people find uh, the experience of being involved in nonprofits to be extremely rewarding. And you know, this is our kind of key for, for satisfaction, autonomy, competence, part of something bigger. And you know, we've talked about recognition a few times. You know, you need to recognize people. Um, people find recognition very rewarding. You know, why is it that recognition is so important? Why is it so motivating to people? Uh, this is a picture of the African savanna. This is where 98% of our ancestors lived. And this is where our brains evolved to survive. And you know, the biggest factor 
uh, in survival on the African savanna was sociability. How well you got along with uh, the people in your little group, usually around 15 people. And uh, it turns out that recognition is a major social cue. Humans are hardwired to be very, very uh, sensitive to recognition. You know, because being recognized said to our ancestors, when there were resources to be shared, you know, think food, they were going to be included. So it really became key to survival. And that's the same brain that we take around with us every day. This is one that was uh, evolved on this African savanna. And this was a theory in social psychology for many years. And then about 20 years ago, uh, brain scanners became uh, cheap and available. And we started putting people in brain scanners and we found out that, that this was true. Um, there's a study in, uh, done at UCLA. They just put folks in, in an MRI scanner and asked them to read simple little recognition statements, things like, uh, when I'm in trouble, I know you're always something, someone that I can count on. And what happens is when people read these kinds of statements, the same reward pathway lights up when they read them that lights up when they eat their favorite food. So that's how fundamental recognition is. That's how perceptive we are of, of rec sensitive we are to recognition. Uh, the gentleman that wrote kind of the textbook on this, Dr. Matthew, Matthew Lieberman, uh, he has a great quote. He says, um, our brains crave the positive, the positive evaluation of others to an almost embarrassing degree. And his research and others showed that, you know, you would think that recognition from a family member or friend would be very powerful, but it turns out that it doesn't even matter if it's someone you know or not. Recognition from a stranger is equally rewarding as someone you know personally. And we know that people want to be recognized. You know, of the billions of dollars that are donated to charitable donations in the United States every year, less than 1% is donated anonymously. So although we find being altruistic and pro-social to be very rewarding, you know, we want other people to see us behaving uh, in, in, in a pro-social manner. And we know that people behave more pro-socially in public than they do in private. So Otis, um, if I could go to Randy for a moment. Randy, what's your experience in terms of recognition and in all the various ways that you deliver it? And, and I will um, say that I have seen Randy deliver recognition so naturally that she has actually challenged me that she wasn't recognizing someone, she was just talking to them. And uh, it, it's just <laughs> a natural thing for you to do. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Sure, um, well, you know, First of all, oh, this is absolutely right. One of the things I've learned in my many years of doing this, and thank you for reminding me, Katrina, how many years I've been doing this. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, uh, people do crave recognition. And I'm not talking about, you know, giving them a tote bag, although you can certainly do that too. But what they really want, and they, and this is so subconscious, and Otis can probably explain all of the whys and wherefores, but they want, they want to be recognized on that stage. Um, they want, uh, and they'll say they don't. You know, they'll say, oh, I don't want any applause. But deep down, they do. Uh, and I do, I mean, some of it's little things that I wouldn't really consider recognition, but I guess it all adds up. For instance, um, you know, that hour and a half during a walk when people are arriving, they're milling around, they're getting their team photos taken, they're grabbing a cup of coffee. I have our DJ using what I call the patter script. And this is a script I've written out for him. And I tell him he doesn't have to use my words. He can put it in his own. But basically... It's the things I need him to say because he's a DJ. He doesn't know what I need him to say. So, you know, thank the committee, each member of the committee by name. So we want to thank today Mary Jones and Tom Smith and Katrina Van Husk for putting on this great event. They're a hardworking group and we really appreciate it. You know, thank the sponsors. Um, you know, remind everybody to check in. Then, you know, start all over again. And um, you know, it, it's uh, a couple of years ago, I came up with this idea. I had this banner made up. It was just an eight foot by four foot plain white vinyl banner. And I put the lettering on it, very colorful. And it was just names. And it, I called it the 
2016 HA All Stars, and I took it everywhere. Every if we had a community network event, I took it and put it up. If we had a kickoff, I took it and put it up. I put it up at the walk. I put it up anywhere and everywhere I could. Nobody could tell looking at the banner what the names were. But when they would ask, I would say, oh, those are our people from last year who raised $1,000 or more. Because they were sitting there that whole kickoff looking at that banner thinking, I want my name up there next year. Or at least that's what I'm hoping they're thinking. Um, then I had a interesting situation which didn't even occur to me that it was recognition. I was introducing two people via email, you know, the way you do. So I was introducing one of our walk chairs from a small town, so it's a small walk, to our new director of uh, uh, program services. And it was sort of like, hey, Mary, I want you to meet Joan. Joan is um, the chair of our Shenandoah, Iowa walk, and one of our most valued volunteers. And she called me later and said, thank you so much for saying that I'm a valued volunteer because I know I'm not the biggest walk. Um, I said, but you're every bit as important as the biggest walk. Uh, I think so sometimes it's Randy, little things. Yeah. And Randy, you do it so naturally that you don't even quantify it. And I think that's a wonderful habit to grow. You said something a few moments ago I wanted to touch on as well which is you said, they won't tell you they want recognition. They will tell you they don't want recognition. Um, right. Our path turnkey down the field of behavioral economics uh, related to fundraising actually started with uh, an exploration of that. We, we saw statistics coming back in regard to what people said they wanted and didn't want that led us down a, a twisty winding road to an exploration of how people form relationships with nonprofits and if you, there are two ways to get that information. You can either buy Otis and Me drinks at bars or you can buy our book. Either one works, but that will explain more of that. But at this moment, um, Otis, can you talk to us about how these relationships are formed and what are the, uh, the things that support them and what are the things that don't support them? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the relationships, as you know. Um, you know, when uh, the relationships that nonprofits and with their constituents are what psychologists typically call social relationships. You know, when you ask a person who's in a social relationship why they do what they do, you know, they usually say something like, well, it's just, it's just the right thing to do. It's, um, their, their, their behavior is very consistent with their attitudes. And boy, oh boy, do you ever want to keep them in these social relationships because they're the kind of relationships that, that keep on giving back to you. But, you know, if you're not careful, it's easy to throw a social relationship out of whack. I'm going to give you an example here. The study was done about 10 years ago in Israel. Uh, it's typically called the daycare study. And uh, tip, uh, Israel had a, has a system of public daycares. And the city of Haifa had a dozen daycares. They had a big problem. They had 25% of their parents picking up their kids late on any given day. And this was becoming a big issue for their management, as you can imagine. So they went to a university and they said, well, you know, what, how can we uh, how can we impact this? And they said, well, why don't you impose a small fine? Just tell the parents that if you pick up their kids late, that they're, you're, they're going to get fined. It was, it was about $3 American. And so they announced it to the parents. They're going to be charging $3 per kid. They picked them up late. And parents all heard the news. And within two weeks, late pickups had increased to 40%. And so this leveled off after two weeks and went on for about the next month, at which point uh, the daycare folks went back to the university and said, you know, what should we do about this? And they said, well, why don't you stop, uh, stop charging the fine? So they announced to the parents they were going to discontinue the fine, at which point late pickups went up to 48%. So it was about double what it was when they started this whole program. Well, you know, how can we explain this? People live in two different worlds. They live in a world of social exchanges and they live in a world of market exchanges. And these two worlds have different norms. And introducing the market norms into a social exchange, introducing the $3 to pick up your kid late into a social exchange, you should do it because it's the right thing to do, it violates the social norms. And what happened was these parents reframed the social relationship 
into a market relationship. Well, how do we know that? We know that because after they did away with the fine, the late pickups increased. You know, now it became an even better deal to stay 30 minutes late at the office. Uh, interestingly, the title of the study is A Fine is a Price. And, you know, once people go from a social relationship to a market relationship, it's very difficult to get them back. I have a friend at Duke University that uh, teaches this, Dr. Dan really He has a great quote in one of his book. He says, once you've offered to pay for her delightful Thanksgiving dinner, your mother-in-law will remember the incident for years to come. And uh, his research and others show that once people move out of these social relationships into a market relationship, it's very difficult to get them back. And if they're not in a social relationship, they're not going to be doing the kinds of things that you want them to do because it's the right thing to do. And so I want to relate that to, to, to motivation now. Um, psychologists talk about two different types of motivation that, that, that corresponds to these social and market relationships. Um, they, they're called intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. You've probably heard of them. I want to start with intrinsic motivation. You know, again, people who are intrinsically motivated, they, they're, they, they'll tell you they're doing what they're doing because it's the right thing to do. This is, a, I'm, I'm from a military family. This is a great example of a soldier that our marketing director found. Um, I have a second cousin that's in his fourth deployment in Afghanistan right now. He makes $22,000 a year. He joined of his own free will, and uh, he's watching his own behavior, you know, because $22,000 isn't a lot to justify uh, risking your life every day. So what happens to, to him, and um, if you'll find there's a surveys of soldiers, is they become very, very patriotic. In other words, the situation that they're in, they're there of their own free will, they're not making any money doing it, that makes them very, very uh, devoted to the cause. It, 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 it enhances their intrinsic motivation. And again, after his fourth deployment, I can guarantee because of that, he'll be re-enlisting for a fifth deployment. He is a true believer. That's what we want to get with your constituents. Now, you know, uh, uh, contrast that with extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation works, you know. You give something to someone and they, they do the behavior and they get whatever it was they were, they were offered to do that behavior. Extrinsic be, uh, uh, motivation works. The problem is after you stop giving people things, they stop doing the behaviors. And so that's why, you know, we don't want to extrinsically reward people uh, who are volunteering for nonprofit because they suggest to them that they're in a market relationship with you. And oh, you want to talk about this? Yeah. So, Randy, you mentioned this banner earlier that you hung just to uh -huh. let people see their own names and let other people wonder why their names were up there. Um, you know, in regard to the extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation, this is an unscripted question, people. So she's she's on the spot now. Um, g give us your experience in terms of monetized incentives or registration fees. Um, oh boy, you you hit a <laughs> you hit a good spot with me. Um, uh, one of the first things that happened when I came to HA was um, we did have some volunteer walk slash runs going on when I joined HA, uh, and we we were charging a $25 registration fee, and everybody got a T-shirt, and I said, nope, that's gone. Uh, we're going to ask them to raise $50 to get a T-shirt, because the T-shirt is now the first level on the recognition program. Now, you know, all of the, the big charities that do walks, heart, cancer, JDRF, American Diabetes, they all do recognition gifts. Raise $250, you get a sweatshirt. Raise $500, you get a blah, blah, blah. And those are great, and they're fine. But that T-shirt and I have been in this business for almost 30 years and I still do not understand what it is about t-shirts, but you know, people will walk on ground glass and their bare feet to get a, a free t-shirt. So I said, this is no longer, we're not selling t-shirts for $25. We're not even selling t-shirts for $75. This is the first level on the recognition program. This is, to reward people who have gone out and worked hard 
and asked friends and family for money. And, um, you know, one of the things that I tell people all the time is never, ever, ever sell T-shirts at the end of the walk because it's a, it's a new chair's natural inclination. Oh, we've got two cases of T-shirts left over. Let's sell them for 10 bucks and get them out of here. Never, 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 never. Because the people that worked hard to raise that 75 won't raise any money for you next year. They'll say, well, we'll just wait till the end of the walk and buy it for 10. Um, um, and again, it, it, it's the first level on the recognition ladder, as I call it. Yeah. And, and yeah, Otis is right about when you stop giving people stuff, you know, um, I, I am very much against things like door prizes. Mm -hmm. And uh, because once you do it, whatever you do becomes the floor, not the ceiling. And when you stop it, people go nuts. They go ballistic. Um, although, as I point out to people, if the only reason they're coming to your walk is to get a door prize, we don't want them there anyway, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, Randy hit on probably the, the biggest pain that, that people feel around monetization of, uh, or, or um, using incentives versus recognition, you know, using money versus honor. Um, Otis, when you heard Randy tell that story, because other people are going to go back to their offices and try and repeat what she said, can you put that in psychologist speak? Like, I'm a, I'm a staff person and I'm going to lobby my executive director not to use the t-shirt as the thing you get when you register for $35. Sure, you know, I, well, yeah, you know, I, 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 that's a, that's a great point, Katrina. And I think it's a very sh subtle shift. You know, um, I'm for banning the word incentive. You know, we, we should never think about things that we give people as incenting, incentivizing them to behave. We should think of these things as recognition items. You know, there are ways to recognize them for the things that they do for us. That that's that's a nice boiling down. Yeah, because, uh, you know, this we hear this a lot. This is probably the biggest question. Registration fees, T-shirts, um, they're really just two of the biggest markers of the thing that is a market relationship. So whether you're giving your parking lot attendants a $25 Starbucks card or you're selling your t-shirt along with the registration or, you know, whatever you're doing. And sometimes the activity itself can be the monetizing event. If it's a thing that people would pay to do and they're paying to do it, you have just entered a market relationship. So, yeah. And, and well, and just to Randy's point about, about the t-shirts, I can't believe how much time I spend thinking about t-shirts uh, as I'm sure Randy does. But, um, you know, those ones you have left over at the end of the at the end of the season, I would say, yes, don't sell them. Don't even give them away. Get them out of the country somehow. You know, the only way that those right. people that got those T-shirts should have those T-shirts is because they did X, Y, Z for your organization. If you start giving them exactly. away to, to the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the Boys and Girls uh, Club, you know, that's, that mm -hmm. might seem like a nice thing to do, but it really diminishes the, uh, the value of that T-shirt and what someone did to get it. So what you're saying then, watch me segue here. Here we go. What you're saying then is that if I use that T-shirt that I'm using as an honor item as something else, I might be damaging someone's intrinsic motivation. You know, funny you should mention that. You know, the, the question is, you know, how do we develop intrinsic motivation? I think that's kind of the, 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 the bigger question. We want people to be intrinsically motivated to do things because for us because it's the right thing to do. Well, you know, um, we want them to do that because we know that people who are intrinsically motivated behave in ways that are consistent with what psychologists call these self labels. And so what we want to do is give people opportunities to develop these self labels. You know, I've got a, I'm a university of Virginia graduate. I've got a university of Virginia class ring on, uh, I got a sticker on my car and so, and so forth. People label themselves in very, uh, in various ways. And these are very powerful, uh, in terms of how we choose to, to behave. It turns out there's a lot of research on this, just one interesting one. If you can get someone to say they're a chocolate lover, as opposed to someone who loves to eat chocolate, that's a very small little distinction. Chocolate lover, someone who loves to eat chocolate, you think, oh, it's the same thing. The people that say I'm a chocolate lover, they will tell you they have a much higher preference for chocolate than people who just say they love to eat chocolate. So these self-labels really are very, very powerful in the ways that we, we think about all kinds of things. So what we want to do is put people in situations where they develop these labels. 
And, you know, Randy talked earlier, she said, make it easy to say yes. Here's the easiest thing to say yes to, two Girl Scouts who are on your front door, Boy Scouts, whatever it is. The peer-to-peer -peer ask, it gets about a 25% uh, positive rate in terms of people saying yes. You know, people have a very difficult time saying yes to these kids. I was victimized by two pimply-faced Boy Scouts about six months ago who were selling Brunswick stew door to door. Uh, they were very sophisticated little marketers, I found out. It was fascinating to watch them. First thing they said was, Mr. Fulton, they knew my name. They said, that I opened the door, they said, they call me by name. Mr. Fulton, I'm blah, blah, blah. You may know my father, Ed. We live over on, uh, on uh, Har uh, Harley Court. And um, of course, I didn't know them, but it again established this connection. Said we're selling Brunswick stew for the for the Boy Scouts. We've sold boy, we sold a lot around here. Your neighbor Dan bought four quarts. I thought, gosh, you know, I'm not going to let Dan buy four quarts, and and I'm not going to buy any. So I said, I'll take five. You know, I'm I'm feeding it to the dogs right now, supplementing their food because I don't even like Brunswick stew. But you know, this is <laughs> the first psychologist call, foot in the door for the organization. Now. Cleverly, again, they had me give them, uh, give me their uh, email address. I gave them the email address. I had to make a check out to Troop 76 uh, uh, Mechanicsville Boy Scouts of America. So now I'm actually doing a behavior. You know, as Randy said, make it easy to say yes. Um, the peer to peer ask is the easiest thing to say yes to because it's very difficult to say no to your peers. And now the Boy Scouts, they had me in what I, we call the affinity funnel. You know, the affinity funnel is, it goes from you don't have any affinity to the Boy Scouts, I'm unaware of them, which is where I was before they showed up on my doorstep, to being an evangelist for the organization. Now they had me in the funnel, they had my email address. And so what did they cleverly do? Did they ask me for more money? No, they asked me to their events. And uh, they had a shrimp and suds on Friday that supporters of the Boy Scouts Troop 76 were invited to. Um, you know, they started to label me as a supporter. Now, I hadn't really supported the Boy Scouts. I had supported these two little pimply faced Boy Scouts that I identified as some, somebody from my neighborhood. But I'd written a check to Boy Scouts. I'd done that first behavior. Peer to peer makes it very easy to say yes. And so they'd gotten me in the funnel and then they worked me by, with recognition uh, to become more and more, uh, to have greater and greater affinity to their organization. Otis, I'm gonna hold you there. We have a couple of live questions and we're gonna answer those and then I'm gonna ask you to roll through the psychological tactics pretty quick so we make it I will. getting in sideways on time. Uh, what are our questions, Tracy? Perfect. The first one is from Isabel. Uh, she has, what about giving away t-shirts as self-identifiers, a way to create a subgroup within the event? What are your thoughts? You know, yes, um, that, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I am not at all for giving away things. Uh, people devalue things that they receive uh, without asking. What you want to do is at least make people ask for the item. That's the very least you want to do. Um, uh, so, so yeah, you know, just, you, you would think that, uh, if you go to your, um, the college and you get, uh, you have ask everybody that goes through the stylist to wear a pin for, um, for the hydrocephalus association, you get uh, 30,000 pins. You think you've got a lot of supporters. You really haven't accomplished much. Mm -mm. Because you're just giving away. No one is asking to be included. So the other side of that, um, you know, Otis is absolutely right. And the data that um, we have about behaviors exhibited or elicited through request for or simply blasting out uh, merchandise or anything supports his statement. Uh, but Randy, I imagine that you have some other thoughts in regard to creating subgroups at the event on site in terms of recognition. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. And it's actually something I've been thinking about trying. I, I haven't yet. Um, but again, uh, I, I'm wondering about maybe doing a t-shirt for people, a different color for people that raise $500 or more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, but again, they're earning it. Um, and, and that's 
the most important thing is they need to feel good about the fact that they went out and asked family and friends to donate to earn this recognition item. Um, I haven't tried it yet. I, I'm thinking about it. it. It's a little difficult because we are volunteer driven and trying to figure out sizes and quantities and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not the gift that makes people do things. You know, it, it, it solidifies their tie to the cause. And I want them wearing that awareness item. You know, it's one of those things where you hear parents say, oh, don't get the sweatshirt, Johnny. We don't want to cost the organization money. And I say, whoa, whoa, time out. I want Johnny out there wearing that nice sweatshirt with our logo because I want the guy in the grocery store to say, hey, hydrocephalus, my brother has that. Um, but he's earned it. It's not something we've given him. It's something he earned by, again, asking friends and family to give us money. So I think what we're saying is that, um, you know, it to be meaningful. It can't just be a, here you go, you've got red hair and it's Tuesday, here's a t-shirt. Um, it has to be something that they earned. And then having them request it is, a, is the best case scenario. Tracy, we had another question? We do, actually we have two rolling in. So keep them coming, thank you so much. Uh, the next okay. one's from Amy. What if you have people using your event to fulfill their own entertainment, not fundraising as requested, just showing up to use your event for fun? What do we do in this case? Oh uh, yeah, the zero dollar participants. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a problem for all of us. Uh, I don't know. I wish I had an answer. Believe me, I'd sell it. Uh, right now, HA, 48% of our walk participants do not turn in any money. However, I'm doing some, I'm, I'm doing a little more analysis on that because uh, in our situation, because almost all of our teams are connected to the mission, they're family teams, a lot of times everybody on the team will put the, all the money under the kid's name. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, I will maintain, and this is why I'm doing some deep dive analysis on this, that out of a team of 20, if they raise $2,300, my guess is that $2,300 was raised by two or three of the people on that team, and the other 17 are just there for the ride. Um, but if it averages out, I mean, so those are all things you have to take into consideration. Um, you know, we've, we've tried a lot of different things trying to, to get those $0 fundraisers, but it's hard to distinguish who they are as com compared to, you know, a team member. Yeah. So That's a very good point, Randy. A couple of other points on that is, um, Sometimes eyeballs are good, especially when you're selling sponsorships. Um, so having them there for that is a great thing and, and can produce revenue. But the other thing that I don't think that we as an industry do well is consider the zero dollar fundraiser, someone who showed up and did nothing, presumably, as the first acquisition event for next year. We have them in our hot mm -hmm. little hands, but we don't really think of them that way. We think of them as, as part of the end of this year. When in fact, you know, if we, if we turned the eye of Sauron on them, then potentially we could convert them. Do we have another uh, question, Trace? We absolutely do. The next one's from Dave, uh, the last one. I really like the idea of recognition levels. Are there examples of events out there where I can see this in action? And then there's another one. <laughs> Thanks, okay. well. um, actually, if you go to almost any national organization um, registration site, you usually can click your way through to that, um, or you can pop us mm -hmm. an email and we can send you Sure. I mean, you can go to the Hydrocephalus Association uh, walk, any of our walk web pages, and at the top you'll see uh, resources and there's a flyer about our recognition items. Yeah. All right. And Trace, last question. Uh, there we go. Do you have any specific advice for recognizing fundraisers in an online peer to peer campaign? Our peer to peer campaigns don't have an in person event component. Mm -hmm. I think um, I saw a movie recently. It was Ready Player One. Otis and I have a terrible sci-fi problem. Uh, and it was interesting. The, the One of the players bought something and he appeared surprised that the item would be delivered in real time, you know, as opposed to his typical delivery, which was digitally. So I think that's um, telling. Uh, and that means that we can deliver recognition 
uh, virtually. Uh, we can do it with badges, we can do it with alerts, we can do it with promoting your name to other people. Uh, but people do also like the thing. Um, and the thing um, is we have to be careful with the thing. And I'm going to stop talking so Otis can talk about the thing. Uh, or things that we might use. But yes, uh, you know, humans are humans, whether they're fundraising for you and show up at an event or they're fundraising for you virtually. Our experience is that the people who fundraise for you virtually look, act, and taste like the team captain at an on the ground event. They have a higher level of affinity and a higher level of uh, opportunity for you to uh, ingrain them more with the idea that they have high affinity through the use of recognition, either in real time or with uh, a virtual means. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Otis. And Otis, uh, we got like, what, Tracy? We have no time, we're done. We, we, no, we, we, have, we, we, have, we have three minutes left and I'm going to take it all. Thank you. So um, we, uh, the Boy Scouts have got me back in the affinity funnel. Let's get back to me back in the funnel. And you know, why is, it, why is that so important? Well. What they play on then is my consistency bias. You know, people have uh, what psychologists call a consistency bias. We want to be consistent in our behaviors over time. I've already written a check to the Boy Scouts of America. That makes it much easier, much more likely that I'll do something else on their behalf because I want my behaviors to be consistent over time. I also want my behaviors and my attitudes to be consistent. And I'm just going to go through a couple of these slides and pick out couple of things that, that folks have asked questions about. In terms of these items that we give people, uh, no matter if it's, uh, you know, t-shirts, whatever, I, I kind of have three uh, guidelines. They should always be branded with your organization's logo. You know, you should never give anything to anybody that's not got your logo stamped on it. They should be of modest value. You know, you don't want people to get the perception that they're in a market relationship. The only reason that they've raised money was because they, they got a blender. And, you know, we talked about getting rid of all the excess t-shirts. It should be otherwise unavailable. You know, there's no way that somebody should have gotten that thing, could have gotten that thing, uh, except to work for your organization. And, um, you know, we see examples of kind of the market relationship, uh, market language work in all the time, sale items. You know, you want to avoid that at all, at all costs. Um, you know, here it is all in one page, kind of uh, amazing rewards, um, raise and win big, so forth. The language of the marketplace, you don't want to have that uh, in your organization. You know, in your organization's messaging at all, uh, it will come back to, uh, to haunt you because it'll be demotivated. And I'm just gonna skip Katrina to the big ideas and let you wrap this up here. So, um you know, what to take away from this is that contrary to popular uh, belief, behavior leads to belief as opposed to belief leads to behavior. That's a hard concept and it's, uh, it's imperative when you're writing strategy and designing your event uh, to keep it first and foremost in your mind. Less is more with gifts. Um, gifts can equate to a badge or on uh, delivered virtually. Um, but if you are using hard goods, make sure that they are modest and branded with your your organization. Self-label changes incrementally. There is no on-off switch. It's a matter of moving them toward a different way to think about themselves. And creating situations and uh, moving them incrementally is the most effective way. And last, recognition is the easy button. Uh, you can deliver it in many, many ways as Randy described, um, but doing it is the most important thing. Thank you so much. Randy, thank you for being with us. Otis, thank you for your help. Thank you. Back to you. Otis, Katrina, and Randy, thank you so much for your valuable insights. I really appreciate how you broke down all the levels of strengthening a donor relationship. It's really excellent stuff, and I love it. Um, so we've reached the end of our time in this session, so thank you so much for joining us. Please note that if you'll be joining us for the next conference session, you're going to need to log back into the next session using the link and dial the number that you received via email when you registered.